Dr. Paul Snellgrove. I'm the Associate Scientific Director of the Ocean Frontier Institute and a professor at Memorial University. I want to recognize that the Ocean Frontier Institute's physical offices are located on ancestral and traditional territories of diverse Indigenous groups in Atlantic Canada. Our Institute is working hard to advance respectful and meaningful partnerships with Indigenous peoples. Welcome to the Ocean Frontier Institute Social Sciences and Humanities Working Group, People and the Ocean Speaker Series. This is, I believe, the sixth of eight planned webinars this year, featuring international experts who seek to understand complex interactions between society, economy, culture, and marine and coastal environments. Thank you all for coming, and my sincere thanks to the Working Group for organizing this most impressive webinar series. I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Paul Foley, an Associate Professor and OFI Module Co-Lead based at Memorial University's Grenfell Campus Environmental Policy Institute. He's going to introduce today's speaker and discussants and moderate today's session. Paul. Thank you, Paul. Uh, it's my great pleasure to introduce our panelists and our two discussants today. Uh, and really, I'm, I'm also just very happy to be able to see these great people and, and spend an hour or so with them, even if it's virtually. Uh, but before I uh, introduce them, I'll say a few words about the event and how it's organized uh, for today. Um, our panelists will speak for about 30 minutes, followed by short presentations by our two discussants, who will each respond for about five minutes. Uh, and we'll have about 10 minutes for, <clears throat> excuse me, our panelists uh, and discussants to respond to each other. Uh, after that, we'll have about 30 minutes for all of us to join in a, in a Q&A session with questions for presenters and the discussants, if you wish. Um, please feel free to start putting questions in the Q&A box uh, during the presentation as well. And I'll also like to call your attention to um, three important sort of do's and don'ts about the Q&A session. Uh, first, please do not use the chat box unless you're running into some technical problems uh, or do not have access to the Q&A box, which I think is the case for the panelists. Uh, we'll only be using the Q&A box to read, respond, and present questions from the audience. Um, and we want everyone's focus to be on the panelists uh, and the discussion, so please just use the Q&A box. Uh, second, when writing a question and comment, please do keep it as brief as you can. Uh, and third, please remember to keep your um, mics muted. Uh, and now again, it's my pleasure to introduce first our presenter, Dr. Kevin St. Martin, uh, who is a professor of geography at Rutgers University. Um, Kevin's a human geographer whose work is at the intersection of economic geography, political ecology, and critical cartography. Uh, his work includes critical analyses of economic and resource management discourse, as well as participatory projects that work to rethink economy and foster economic and environmental well-being. Um, Dr. St. Martin's projects have in common the regulation and transformation of the marine environment. Uh, and in particular, he uses the paradigmatic case of fisheries in the U.S. Northeast to better understand the power of discourse, data, and devices to shape economic and environmental outcomes. Um, our two discussants are Dr. Bonnie McKay and Dr. Jennifer Silver. Uh, Dr. McKay's PhD in environmental anthropology from Columbia University led to a career on the faculty of Rutgers University in New Jersey. Uh, her research, mainly in Canada, the US and Mexico, focuses on coastal communities and nearshore fisheries. Uh, and a guiding theme of her work is understanding intersections of property, environment, and community as they play out in the use and management of common pool resources in changing environments. Uh, Dr. Jennifer Silver is an associate professor in geography, environment, and geomatics at the University of Guelph. Uh, she is a political ecologist with interest in oceans, fisheries, and global environmental governance. Uh, currently, funded projects address access, equity and inequity, and financialization in Canadian Pacific fisheries, and explore the promotion and adoption of digital and surveillance technologies by prominent actors within the international ocean community. So it's so great to see uh, the three of you here. Um, and now, Kevin, uh, over to you. Thank you so much, Paul, for that uh, generous introduction. I really appreciate it. Uh, and I really appreciate being invited here. I'm truly honored to be part of this speaker series uh, and a guest of the Ocean Frontier Institute. So thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I'm going to share my screen. I have a PowerPoint uh, and then I'll, I'll jump right into my presentation.
Okay, that should, you should be able to see my PowerPoint with the first slide, creating openings for community and commons in the digital ocean. That's the title of my talk uh, for today. Okay, let me set my timer, 30 minutes, great. Um, so much of my research has involved working with fishers in the Northeast of the United States. It's self famous for relatively small scale fishing communities that dot the coast from North Carolina to the Canadian border. I'm interested in these communities um, because many could be characterized as sites of local or community economy that foreground livelihood over accumulation as Tony Davis famously coined. That such community economies are resident in the very urban and industrialized Northeast of the United States, that they've survived waves of neoliberal resource management measures that prioritize privatization, and that they continue to innovate on behalf of community and environmental well being suggests processes and practices that are clearly outside of hegemonic or common understandings of fishing as the practice of utility maximizing fishermen tragically overfishing the marine commons. So there's much going on in these communities that the diligent scholar of economic difference and economic possibility, that's, that's me, um, that I might work to explicate and amplify these processes and practices, perhaps in the form of ethnographic or workshop settings or other more face-to-face -face engagements with fishermen that explore the relationalities constitutive of communities and commons. What makes those communities and commons? especially where none were thought to exist, right, in industrial fishing in the Northeast. Indeed, my own research has been largely characterized by such engagements where I have in particular used maps as a device to solicit map-based stories of cooperation, the exchange of environmental knowledge amongst fishermen, and concern for community and environmental survival. These projects have not only worked to document a fishing uh, difference present within the industrial fisheries of the North, Northeast, but they've also been entangled with novel community economy initiatives, such as community supported fishing. And if you're familiar with com community supported fishing, you'll know that it's modeled after community supported agriculture, right? A crop, sh uh, crop sharing or subscription approach to food distribution that links consumers and producers directly together. In Port, Port Clyde, Maine, one of the very first community supported fishing initiatives in the United States, right? Their work was entangled with mine. They were inspired by seeing their community and commons laid out on a map before them in work that I was doing. And fishers there worked hard to develop an alternative market to their catch that respected community and environmental needs. Okay, so I call these map-based projects uh, and the data that um, is derived uh, and used with those maps, I call these projects communities at sea because they map the locations at sea frequented by communities, understood as peer groups of vessels from the same port, often using the same gear, perhaps boats that are styled and similar in size and so on. And that those peer groups of vessels very often also fish the very same fishing grounds. While fishermen know these locations intimately and those relationships are no surprise to fishermen, seeing them expressed as a territory, as an environment to steward, and as a site of a shared dependency on a map works to challenge notions of fishers as independent, free roaming and utility maximizing. Rather than fishing effort, quantities of catch or estimated value of catch, communities at sea puts communities on the map, making them visible to fishery science and management, to planners and developers, and in the case of Port Clyde, to fishers themselves. So in these projects, it's clear um, that the face-to-face -face mattered that the workshop was vital and productive and clearly a site where uh, fishermen's attitudes and identities might shift uh, relative to economic and environmental issues. It was also clear, however, that the maps themselves did much of the work needed for such rethinking, 
The maps offered a place that fishers and other community members could fill with their own histories, livelihoods, meanings, and perhaps potentials. And let's just have a quick look at what I'm talking about. What are these maps that I'm talking about? Um, maps used in uh, sort of map history and map-based interviews, map-based workshops that I've done in a, in a number of places in the Northeast of the United States, where on the maps we can put data showing the territories of use by fishermen. And then we can ask fishermen, what do those spaces mean to you? How long have you been fishing there? What kind of environmental knowledge do you have about those places on those maps? Uh, and how, uh, how dedicated are you to those locations and so on, right? We can ask a whole range of questions that give a kind of rich and ethnographic meaning to place in the ocean. Okay, let me just see. Uh, okay, we won't go there yet. Um, thinking in these terms is to be attentive to what we call the ontological politics of mapping, which is to say the politics of categories, of processes, and the worlds that they inscribe. While this is nothing new, perhaps theoretically, to a lot of academics who might be online here, for me it was really useful to think in these terms, to imagine my own research as uh, having an effect in the world and to imagine that my engagements could, in some sense, design or influence new economies uh, in, in fishing, right? That relationship between the maps that, and the mapping project that I was part of and the way that that produced uh, a community-supported fishing initiative in Port Clyde, Maine. Yet over the last decade or so, I cannot but worry about the limits of these projects not as necessary or permanent limitations, but as limits nonetheless that hamper the durability of such initiatives in the face of, for example, management regimes um, that are making it nearly impossible uh, for fishers to access uh, fish, in the face of rapidly developing wind energy sector that threatens to displace fishers from traditional fishing grounds, in the face of a conservation mandate to save, for example, whales and other objects of conservation by setting aside 30% of the ocean. And of course, the ongoing transformation of oceans due to climate change. These are extraordinary and powerful phenomena that have been busy territorializing the ocean through their wielding of an ever expanding digital inventory of marine life, environments, and human engagements. They're well-funded advocates and organizations, and their increasing propensity to align their own interests and capacities with each other through consolidated ocean planning initiatives, data portals, best decision-making practices, and so on, all of which it is hard to see, it is not hard to see, I'm sorry, uh, the elision of small-scale fishing and the lived experiences and practices and places of fishing communities. So I don't mean to dampen our spirits uh, and suggest that the innovative practices of fishing communities are short-lived and ultimately failed. On the contrary, I wish to suggest we need to work hard to document how other concerns, wind energy, climate change, conservation, and so on, are really successful uh, at territorializing the ocean. How do they do it? And shouldn't we be doing something comparable? How might we struggle on behalf of community and commons within marine planning initiatives and forums, within data portals and websites, within the range of emerging decision-making tools, within analytics of environmental and climate change, and so on. So one way might be to recognize that such territorializations are largely driven by the formation of what we might call the digital ocean. The ocean as known, understood, managed, and exploited through a host of digital apparatus. Taking that as our starting point, how might we associate communities and commons with such an apparatus? How can we make them digital and algorithmic rather than cartographic? How can we make them territorializing rather than just representational? So to do so is to recognize and foreground the fact that the maps that I've been using in my projects are also um, digital data. They are also the result of a simple algorithm that produces those images on those maps. So as it turns out, 
Um, and let me just show you that algorithm. I know you're fascinated by it. There it is. Uh, here's, here's the data that I work with on the left, which is a uh, vessel trip report data, logbook data, quite simple points that uh, in the ocean that simply say, this is the location of a fishing trip. That's really all the data is, right? But what's so important about that point in the ocean is you can attach to it a whole range of attributes, a whole range of connections to processes on the coast, fishing gear, uh, numbers of crew members on that boat, the length of the boat, what did they catch, how many species, right? There's a whole range of data that can be spatialized and turned into map form given that point in the ocean, right? And there's the algorithm that sort of aggregates the data um, by what I call communities at sea, simply lumping those points by the peer groups of vessels that um, are fishing more or less near each other and from the same port. And if you look on the left, you can see indeed the color there responds to vessels from the same port and with the same gear types. And you can see that indeed, many of them do start to cluster around particular fishing grounds. Again, no, not a surprise to fishermen, um, but uh, it, interesting to put on a map. Okay, so the communities at sea data that I use is indeed compatible with, rather than contrary to, statistics, enumeration, and integration with other calculations. And it is this quality, this algorithmic aspect of communities at sea that I would like to trace. So the simple question is, if communities at sea data and mapping was useful to Port Clyde in sort of the formation of community supported fishing, how might that data be useful if it were uh, expanded beyond one site, if it were expanded to a region wide kind of look at communities? Okay. Um, while this presentation then traces the path of an algorithm through a few projects that I'm going to going to turn to in a minute. It also traces a movement from what I call representation, that simple putting the community on the map to something I'm calling territorialization, which is to say communities being related, connected, and integrated into an emerging understanding of the ocean. From a logic of simply putting communities on the map in the hopes of recognition to a logic of coordination, with other oceanic processes and actors, and this territorialization of the digital ocean by communities. A logic of combination that explicates the relationalities between community dynamics and other oceanic dynamics, right? That we can see as this kind of connections to the dynamics of climate change, a range of blue economy developments, wind gen uh, generation, and so on. Okay, a lot of the projects that I've been entangled with um, are more recently are about climate change in particular. So like other social scientists, I've been drawn into interdisciplinary projects um, that uh, focus on climate change in the marine environment. While I'm of course very much concerned about climate change, I also saw these engagements with other scientists as an opportunity to trace communities at sea, to trace this algorithm and to see what work it might do when integrated with more powerful actors and agencies of climate change, right? They're, why are they more powerful? They're more powerful because they're funded, because they get publications, because their influence on policy is much bigger and so on and so forth, right? That could they be a vehicle for amplifying community and commons concerns? It's important to note that it's the very algorithmic aspect of communities at sea that made this possible, that lends, lends itself to this kind of combination. Um, and so I'm going to, I'm going to jump a little bit right to these projects. Um, let me find my place here, sorry. Okay, so the first project that I want to illustrate just briefly, and I'm going to, I'm going to go to my uh, slide, I'm jumping ahead to this slide. This slide here is, is a, a simple um, 
uh, flow chart kind of uh, diagram, system sort of diagram that was used in a project that uh, Bonnie and I were both actually very much involved in, uh, a coastal seas funded NSF project that was looking at um, climate change uh, effect on the abundance and distribution of fish, fish species. And then that relationship between fishing communities and those changes in abundance and distribution of fish species. Okay, uh, and that spun off a, a range of projects that I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk about now. The first project uh, was an analysis that examined how fishing communities at sea have responded to changing environmental conditions. In particular, the movement poleward or north of commercially important species in the Northeast of the United States. What we found was that communities composed of large vessels were more mobile, perhaps not a surprise, and could follow species as they shifted north whereas communities made up of smaller vessels did best when they fished a diversity of species. The results point to diversity and mobility as important to climate change adaptation. Also along the way, the analysis notes the decline or disappearance of the data of smaller communities that were unable to diversify in the face of environmental change. I just wanna show you a few slides from a paper that we published on this work to sort of illustrate these dynamics. And what I'm trying to get at here is rather than just a simple map showing an outline of where a fishing community goes fishing, which of course is important for impact analyses and other kinds of work. What I'm trying to illustrate with these projects is that we're getting uh, closer and closer, we're getting more and more um, uh, clear about the range of dynamics of these communities, right? These communities as um, moving, shifting, adapting, innovating, and so on, right? Like I'm, I'm increasingly interested in those dynamics as opposed to just putting communities on the map and hoping the state or somebody else recognizes them and does something for them, right? Like this is, this is the point here. So what kind of dynamics do we see? Well, in this very first paper, what we saw was in the analysis, a statistical analysis that used these um, definitions of community algorithmically, right? What we see, for example, in this chart at the top, on the left-hand side, we say, well, for communities composed of large vessels, um, how many communities have shifted in terms of latitude, which is to say, do they follow fish or not? Are they moving north or not, along with a range of fish species? And what we see is, for the most part, even large vessel communities don't move much, right? If you look, the, the most communities, uh, the example here is Portland, Maine, are not shifting latitude as species are shifting latitude. However, there are some communities, such as Beaufort, North Carolina, that have shifted dramatically in the search for fish, in their case, following summer flounder as, it, uh, as its abundance has moved north over time. For small vessels that are also trawling for ground fish in particular, in this case, um, by and large, we see almost no shift in terms of moving north. Right? That is to say their strategy for adapting to changes in fish distribution and abundance is not to move off of their fishing grounds. They are not following fish. So if you look at those two charts together, what you see is most boats don't follow fish. Uh, they stay where they are. They stay on traditional fishing grounds. And we've statistically analyzed that as well. Um, here's just another graph from the same paper showing similar story. What's interesting about these graphs is that each of these dots, the black dots, represent one of these communities, uh, trawling communities. And if the dot is hollow, that community no longer exists in the data, which is to say we have all this uh, vessel trip report data, and then we no longer have vessel trip report data for that port. Uh, so if that's understood as an absolute decline in fishing, what we can say here on the graph at the top for, for large vessels, if you look at the diversity of species that those 
um, vessels catch, right? And remember, we're looking at dynamics that include mobility, the movement of following fish as an adaptation strategy, or shifting species as another dynamic of adaptation. What we see here is that with, uh, um, with a, those large vessels that shift north a lot, like this one here at the top, are actually have a very low species diversity. They're following one kind of fish. They're dedicated to one kind of fish. Vessels that have a high species diversity on the right-hand side of the same graph are simply not moving north, which is to say, clearly their strategy is more about shifting species or uh, leaning on a diversity of species rather than mobility. Uh, and that, but uh, the, the, the open circles are telling us of about another phenomenon, right? The complete disappearance of those communities. So if you look at the bottom here, what we see for, I'll just go right to this one on the right. These are small trawlers. And what we see here is as diversity increases to the right in terms of diversity of catch, you have more communities essentially surviving over time, which are those black dots. And if you look a little to the left, communities that had lower diversity catch, uh, catch diversity uh, no longer exist in the data set. So there's a statistical relationship between these, these dynamics of adaptation and the survival of these communities. Okay, back to um, my boring reading. One way to view the paper that, that I was just giving you the key results from is as a rather compelling story about the fate of fishing communities over the last 15 or 20 years delivered via spatial statistics. While it is meant to document adaptations and responses to changes in species range, it also, from the perspective of a fishery social scientist like myself, implies dramatic changes in not only fishing practices, but communities, livelihoods, employment, mobilities, and so on. For example, fishing hundreds of kilometers further to the north clearly has implications for crew composition, family structure, ties to processors, and the disappearance from the data of entire fishing communities is likely a sign of much more than some kind of adaptation strategy. But, and this I had to really learn, right? What is implied, even if corroborated by 20 years of social science experience in the fishing communities, my own qualita qualitatively derived expertise, that this kind of uh, speculation would be excised from the article by the reviewers. There was no room for qualitative speculation. What uh, that is, there was a real focus on the quantitative and what it could tell, right? So what would remain was what the algorithm analyzed by a battery of presumably non-speculative statistical methods could say, what the statistics could confirm and what the graphs could portray, which was a range of spatial pattern responses, and this is key, by a particular unit of analysis called community. Right, that was my contribution to this whole thing. So while I found this frustrating, a little bit, not much, I could also see a powerful plus side to this kind of publication. That is, while these adaptations have already been documented by many fisheries social scientists, right? Diversity is useful to the sustainability of communities. And maybe those were documented ethnographically or in interviews and other methods, their results have been less scalable, unable to encompass all communities along the entire coast, less combinable with measures and projections of climate change, and less mobile in terms of where and how such results might find purchase. These scientists, meaning the, the scientists I've been working with, they get interviewed regularly about their findings, right, by the press. They get published in uh, arguably more powerful journals than geography journals. Indeed, the article was picked up by various news outlets and was most interesting uh, about those reports was how they foregrounded community, right? And here, let me just show you some of the headlines that came out that actually referenced this work. Um, and we can see community, community, community is kind of all, all over the place there. So despite all the objective scientific terminology and the, rel oops, sorry, 
and the relative burying of implications in the academic and algorithmically driven article, the press about the article amplified the very impacts on and implications for communities. So this project made clear that communities at sea as an algorithm, rather than just a colorful outline on a map, could be associated and entangled with a range of powerful actors and agencies focused on the problem of climate change. And in so doing, the concerns of community could be amplified beyond the confines of any one community to a region-wide analysis. At the same time, communities at sea go from an area associated with a port and a gear type to a dynamic entity that moves, responds to environmental change, adapts in particular and statistically significant ways. We see perhaps the beginning of a modeling potential, an alignment with other modeled oceanic entities and actors. And in so doing, communities are reified and amplified as foundations for analysis, knowledge production, oceanic planning, and so on. In some sense, we see the beginning of a movement from community as a site of impact expressed in a map to an agentic force with a distinct capacity and potential, right? This is what I'm interested in um, producing. I'm gonna skip ahead here. I'm looking at the time and I've got about five minutes left. Is that right? Um, who am I asking? The only person I can see is Jen. So I'm asking Jen um, and she doesn't know. Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna skip ahead because I wanna be on time. So that's gonna take me a second to pause here. And I'm going to jump ahead past some beautiful graphs, but I got to move on. Okay, the last project I want to mention is uh, rather ongoing still. And it strives to develop region wide indices of exposure and vulnerability to climate change. And it too does this relative to these communities at sea. This project foregrounds past responses to fishing of fishing communities to environmental change. Have they moved? Have they switched species? Have they switched ports and so on? These dynamics that we can see evidence of in the record of logbook data. And are these um, past changes and movements reflective of their capacities to adapt in the future? That's sort of the idea of this project. So if a targeted species uh, moved substantially north, like summer flounder, for example, did the community respond by fishing further north, as we saw that some communities, but relatively few do? Or did they switch species? Or perhaps they changed their port of association to a new location? Can we use these responses to characterize, perhaps produce a typology of fishing communities based on their capacities to adapt? Right, and the slide you're seeing is, is the model for this project, right, which is a rather complicated, but not so much so, right? If you look at the end of the model on the bottom left, what, what we're aiming for is a kind of atlas or typology of communities with indicators of vulnerability to climate change, right? We want to understand the, these communities and their uh, propensity to adapt uh, or not to a changing environment. If we start at the top of that, that simple um, model, we can see that we start with these communities at sea, right? Which is to say those simple map-based outlines of where communities go fishing. But using that, we can start to get at the dynamics of adaptation and so on, right? So knowing the area that a community is reliant upon, we can look at the historical a change in, in terms of uh, fish abundance and distribution. And we can project into the future, given climate change models, what kinds of species abundance and distribution will exist in the territories of those fishing communities. And you might say, well, they're gonna follow the fish if the fish are gone. We see very little evidence of that so far in the data we've analyzed, right? Um, we can then using, know it, knowing which fish are gonna be in their fishing grounds, we can then talk in terms of social sensitivity or you know, the dependence on those species in terms of value and catch. 
And then, and this is really the, the tricky, uh, but really exciting part, we can integrate into this model, this idea of an adaptive capacity. Has that community shown ev any evidence of mobility off of its fishing grounds or not? Has that community shown any strong evidence of switching species as an adaptive strategy? Has that community shown any evidence of moving uh, to another port, for example? These uh, dynamics of adaptive capacity, we're also pulling out of the data in really exciting ways for this project. Uh, so for example, in terms of, uh, in terms of a shifting ground, shifting fishing grounds, we use this principal components analysis and median trend analysis to essentially make maps that can show us and create basic statistics around fidelity to fishing grounds. I won't go into the technical part of it, except to say on these maps that you're looking at, um, the dark black outlined area is sort of the fishing grounds that are have been used by these communities for two decades now. And within many of them, we can see movement uh, from blue to red, which is to say uh, away from blue areas and toward red areas. A lot of these changes are not dramatic, except for the one on the far left, which is the Beaufort, North Carolina, dramatically moving farther north. Many of the others are all more or less hanging out in the same areas where they've always fished with some minor shifts um, uh, within those areas. Uh, and we can create a statistic around that as a sort of fidelity to fishing ground. Um, the other sort of dynamic I was talking about, shifting target species, we can look at the record of what species were caught within these uh, fishing grounds and how those uh, combinations of fish have changed. We can also look at shifting port association for all of these communities, right? This graph is a little, um, I, uh, let me just explain it really quickly. If we look at just one of these squares on the upper left, we have uh, small scale ground fishing vessels and communities uh, that use small scale ground fishing vessels such as Port Clyde, Gloucester, Plymouth, and so on. And the red bar is telling you that the trips landed in that port are by vessels that have told us this is their port. They've declared this is my port, right? They have a strong association with the port. The blue bar is telling us that those trips are landed by boats that land there a lot, but it's not their home port. And the green is telling us those are trips landed by interlopers, boats that just kind of come along one or one off and land there, right? And what do you see from the left to the right box? The left box is the past. That's like 15 years ago. The right box is like the last five years. And what you see is this increase in mobility between ports. Small, even small scale trawlers are moving between these ports a lot more than they used to, right? The blue bars are getting a lot bigger, which is to say, I'm landing there a lot, even though that's not my home port. The green bars are getting bitter, bigger. I'm on just an interloper moving along and I'm landing all over the place. If you look at the two boxes on the bottom, those are large trawlers, community, large trawling communities. And you see there, Beaufort, North Carolina, and Stonington, Connecticut, you've got these big trawlers coming in and out, in and out, in and out, that are no longer, um, arguably no longer part of that community, right? Like we, if we're, the social scientists might read this and see communities as being more stable on the left and communities on the right being much more uh, mobile and, and, and so on. Okay, I wanna show, just because I, I really love it, um, this last set of graphs, and then I'll read my conclusion. Okay, so this set of graphs comes from the same work, and it's um, surprisingly uh, uh, beautiful to me. The, the colors represent different gear types. Okay, let me start at the beginning. The big four columns represent uh, states. So the big column on the left is the state of Maine, and the names on the left of that column are all of the ports in Maine from north to south, right? They're, they're organized by latitude. And then for every port, I have several bars depending on the gear groups that are found in that port. And then 
looking from left to right within that column, that's over time. Every little box is a year. And so we see like, oh, a whole string of red boxes. Oh, that's, they've just been lobstering there for the last 20 years. Oh, I see a string of blue boxes that stopped 10 years ago. Oh, they were small scale trawling until quota management came in and then they stopped small scale trawling and the small scale trawling disappears. Oh, I see, a, I see a, a port with like six bright colored rainbow. Oh, that's a really big port that has like several fleets of boats, right? And you can see that in the data. I'll zoom in to see it more closely. We see here, for example, Massachusetts at the top. Um, if we look at Newburyport, Massachusetts here on the left, you can see that there are several gear types associated with that port. And over time, they start to disappear. Um, and here, the bottom one, the, the gray is dredge, the light blue is small scale trawling, the red is lobstering, the darker blue is shrimp trawling. And we see that over time in the latest data, we have virtually no trips by any of these vessels. And if we look on the right, we have a, an index of diversity for that port. Its diversity has gone way down <laughs> uh, to zero because there's no more, uh, or almost no more fishing from there. If you look at Rockport, Maine, you can see, well, in the beginning of the data set, they started with four or five different gear types. By the end, we've only got lobster. And you can see the diversity uh, going down, diversity in terms of gear types and uh, goes way down. Here's the, the really big prominent port of Gloucester, Massachusetts with a whole range of gear types. And you see over time, you still see a whole range of gear types. But if you look at the diversity index, what it's telling you is that the numbers of trips by that diversity, by that very diverse fleet is actually narrowing and that one or two of those gear types are most trips are uh, most likely lobstering and small scale trawling are really what's the driving most there. The, what's striking about these uh, images, here's, here's Maine, the mid coast part of Maine, as you move from left to right, you see all the, small scale trawling and the um, shrimp trawling disappearing from the data. And you see all that's left is a few lobstering communities up and down the coast, right? So, so not only the lack of diversity, the actual disappearance of, of these fishing communities. Okay, so time to just conclude. I'm sorry to conclude on a rather low note there because I try to always conclude with more exciting notes, but, um, my conclusion is that in the bad old days, and here I'm talking about the 1990s when even I was um, a grad student, fishing communities were deeply opposed to fishing science and management. They saw both as in collusion to take away access to fish and to undermine livelihoods, the end of their way of life. Fishery social scientists were of course sympathetic and both social scientists and communities foretold what might happen in the near future. Much of that has happened. That previous, uh, that graph that's up right now uh, sort of illustrates some of that, right? With the privatization of fish under quota management, consolidation of access to fish into fewer and more corporate owners. Oops, sorry. The political fora, which used to be raucous and contentious gatherings where fishermen and the communities they represented struggled with environmental organizations and the government over management are now rather post political affairs where consultants to corporate fishing enterprises and other fishing industry associations engage with fishery scientists and managers to optimize catch. Controversies concerning impacts of communities and livelihoods are largely settled and communities as political actors are uh, less and less common in these different decision making uh, venues. The algorithm traced here, which inscribed communities at sea into climate change science is enacting another politics, what we might refer to as an ontological politics, politics of category and definition which is no less contentious, right? The unit of analysis community. 
It too struggles with other understandings of fisheries, particularly those that insist upon a utility maximizing individual as the unit of analysis. Importantly, the struggle for a world of communities and commons is made more effective by virtue of communities and commons being algorithmically enacted. In this case, the case of these projects I've been working on, my hopeful uh, um, work, is communities at sea is able to adapt to a number of contexts, to integrate with other metrological projects, and to be shared uh, as an object of analysis by both social and ecological scientists. It is, of course, always uncertain what will be the outcome of such politics or where such an enactment will lead. But it's heartening, uh, to some degree, uh, to read the compelling news reports that we saw published uh, based on this work that focus on the plight and the challenges faced uh, by fishing communities. So thank you for your attention. Much appreciated. And apologies for going over a few minutes there. Well, thanks so much, Kevin. That was absolutely fascinating. Um, and I'll just pass it over to the discussants now. We'll take about five minutes each. Um, and, and I don't know if you have an order pick, folks, but uh, if not, uh, uh, Bonnie was first on my list. So Bonnie, you could take it over if there's no. Um... OK, well, well, thank you. First of all, thank you to the Ocean, the, the Ocean Futures Initiative um, and to Paul and Barbara for Paul Snowgob and Barbara Nice for organizing this. and. Um, and Paul Foley for 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 jeopardizing for jeopardizing that's not the correct word. <laughs> you know what I mean. Anyway, I really um, I I just want to thank thank Kevin as always for um, once again instructing and bedazzling and inspiring. And it and it's uh, I've been work, privileged to work with with you, Kevin, on some projects and. And I've, and I've had to been able to see and then personally experience the impacts of your work, which have transformed my way of thinking and that of so many others. And I, I can see how readily this work is appreciated and taken up by ocean scientists of many different types, as well as in policy arenas. And you're right, the algorithm and the graphics really work. And your communities at sea work has shown the possibility now and, and in this case, the reality of, of realizing the vision of a truly integrated science of the oceans is the first example that comes to mind when one is challenged on this matter of can we really integrate the social sciences with the other sciences and the oceans. And the graphic images do indeed fire up the imagination. No question about it. Communities, no matter how nebulous and disputed their meaning, are squarely on the local, regional, and national agendas for fisheries, and to a considerable degree, the oceans and coasts writ large. This concept of community appears in so many more ways now than ever before. And your work has also helped keep social science at the table. Its authority, bolstered indeed by GIS, making critical geography, makes made critical geography a companion and a counterforce to economics which is the usually more dominant social science at the table. And, um, and, it's, and of course, I think it's been, it's kept social sciences um, a, more of a colleague with the other sciences, with the natural and physical sciences at the table. By the table, I have in mind the epistemic communities that surround ocean research and policy. And I'm gonna talk a bit about a recent example, which is there's a loose multidisciplinary network that's been pulled together by the Biden administration in the United States to carry out the US component of the UN decade for the ocean. Under the auspices of the National Academy of Sciences, uh, a, a non-governmental committee has been formed for the nation to, to figure out how the US can do its part for this UN decade of the oceans. And the spirit of this effort, which is less than a year old in, in reality, may be revealed in the initial step, which was inviting the community. And the community apparently has meant government, academic, and private researchers. So it's not, it's not as inclusive as its vision suggests. But, but this community uh, came up, it decided to come up with the, the marine equivalent of moonshots. 
So they called upon others in this last large community to, to come up with ocean shots, which are uh, generating hundreds and hundreds of ideas, ways that ocean science can fulfill the UN vision, which was the science we need for the future we want. And this committee then had, has all these ideas and had was then had dispatched to put together a report to, um, to using this bottom-up approach to policy setting to come up with some general frame frameworks for how the US can move ahead. And in reviewing their work, which the report, by the way, has not quite yet hit the street, but it soon will. What I found interesting and relevant to your talk, Kevin, is the juxtaposition and tension between the two foundational cross-cutting themes. One of them is called an ocean of data, and the other cross-cutting foundational theme is an inclusive and equitable ocean. And the former is, of course, all about using artificial intelligence and machine learning, et cetera, to help make sense of tons and tons of observational data, and hopefully more of, that, of observational data in ways that an open access policy would actually make sense to users. So there's a lot of F focus on that. And the latter, an inclusive and equitable ocean, is, of course, a vision of greater representation of the actual diversity of gender, uh, race, ethnicity, discipline, and so forth out there in the community and their representation in the actual ocean sciences. It's also in parts of the report a stronger, uh, a stronger call for historically marginalized stakeholders to be involved in research planning and implementation execution. And yes, of course, in general, the idea of the co-production of knowledge. So these these are major major themes that are supposed that then are. Uh, found in, in the whole report over and over again. Now, my first, upon my first reading of the report, the first time I was invited to do, be involved in reviewing it, these two seem really far apart. But some nudging fueled by Kevin's communities of C um, approaches, as well as by my own experience chairing a, a committee on fisheries management issues that involved people um, economists, anthropologists, geographers, and biologists, et cetera. Um, we, we, uh, the, we, nudged, we nudged the committee to rethink these, these two um, foundational reports and their relationship to each other. And this led to a significant addition to the description of the ocean of data foundational theme. It now includes text about finding ways to relate place-based knowledge to the large scale big data approaches so that the diversity and the particularity of real life communities, whether they're at sea or at land, has some visibility in the digital data world. Now, the committee leaves it up to the future because how, how can this happen and whether will it happen? So this is up to workshops to come. This amendment also recognized the challenges that came up so clearly in my committee's work of integrating information that is qualitative and, as Kevin noted, speculative, often in interpretation, uh, in settings where the proofs of evidence are more narrowly defined. So the revision now reads, including finding ways to incorporate many types of data, including different types of evidence that are important for the co-creation of knowledge. That this language could ever appear, appear in a report that is weighted heavily by a legacy of physical oceanography is truly remarkable. And I think the, you know, Kevin, your work, the introduction of your algorithms and pixels really to represent dimensions of community has made a huge difference to this. And again, how we have to ask and whether it's up to workshops to come and to the brilliant work by a new generation of transdisciplinary scholars. So meanwhile, we struggle we all struggled to illuminate uh, both communities at sea and communities on land. Where are the people? And who are they in official data? A big question, not always easy to answer. Can we use participatory census taking to document fishing households, et cetera, to make up for the huge gaps in what we need to know to assess socioeconomic and cultural impacts and of fisheries changes and on offshore energy development and so forth. You know, can we be talking about ethnographic citizen science? And what about ethnography? 
what happened to those disappeared communities? What are they? What, what, how does a disappeared community at sea relate to any kind of community on land? What was going on there and what has happened there? Um, and just finally, how, how, can, how can we talk of an, and here I'm quoting from the report, an open, actionable, and equitable digital ecosystem for ocean knowledge? open, actionable, and equitable digital ecosystem for ocean knowledge. How can, how can talk of, of that kind help us in matters like this? So more workshops or just more brilliant minds like your own to, to uh, deal with these. Thank you so much, Kevin. This was a great talk. Yes, I guess I'm up. Um, so thank you for the invitation to be here today and, and to the organizers, um, all, of, all of you have brought us together here. Uh, I'm delighted to have the chance to speak um, and I'm also really was excited to have the chance to listen to Kevin and to, to Bonnie just now. Um, so really, really happy to be participating. Uh, I'm joining from North Vancouver uh, in British Columbia. So that's situated along a body of ocean water uh, commonly called Burrard Inlet. Uh, North Vancouver is unceded Coast Salish territory, namely that of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh people. So I was, I was thinking about and preparing for this um, People in the Ocean webinar last week. It struck me as very poignant that I was looking out over the waters that the Tsleil-Waututh, um, that they come from, that is the, the Indigenous name for Burrard Inlet is Tsleil-Wat, and the translation of Tsleil-Waututh to English is People of the Inlet. Um, so I wanted to share this as an opening to acknowledge the territory where I'm joining from, but also to remind that the work that we do as social scientists and humanists um, can and should help to unpack and push back against Western European nomenclatures and structures that shape our relations with uh, each other and the world around us. So Kevin, as we've just heard, Kevin's work does just this. Uh, he unpacks economy and environment and asks and answers questions in ways that create space for thinking and relating beyond capitalism. Um, and as somebody who's read Kevin's work uh, since the days of graduate school, <laughs> the best way that I could think of to illustrate this um, was reading from the abstract of one of the first papers of Kevin's that I remember reading. And it, I mean, we've heard, we've heard this in Kevin's own words, um, although slightly different in the talk today. Quote, the dominant discourse of fishery science and management, which is bioeconomics, places the behavior of individual fishermen operating in an open access commons at the center of its understanding of fisheries resources. And uh, goes on to say, remapping fisheries in terms of fishers' perceptions and scales of operation reveals diverse natural landscapes and communities where the dominant discourse of bioeconomics charted only quantities of fish and individual fishermen. So Kevin, thanks for your talk today. Um, it strikes me as, um, you know, uh, uh, giving us additional layers onto that, uh, onto that paper that I quoted from just now. And um, it's important and new in the sense as well, that I think that it draws attention to different te techno-scientific processes like marine spatial planning. So I definitely see layers being added on and attention to, to different, um, again, techno-scientific processes. And I think that's helpful and really exciting for me because it explores the ways in which the digital, um, broadly construed, may accelerate and perhaps even change the mechanics of territorialization and commodification or perhaps de decommodification. You took us into the wildly exciting world um, of, of data and algorithms, so I thank you for that. Um, I like digging, I like the way in which you, you dig in and, and use and illustrate through the algorithm in the, in the paper. So I have a couple of main comments, um, hopefully to generate co uh, conversation, of course. Um, also somewhat selfishly wanted to raise some questions that I don't have full or, or, or great answers to um, at this stage. So I'm gonna start with a theme that Kevin spoke to and, and, and is evident in the paper and a lot of what Kevin writes and has done, specifically that which organizes, rationalizes and reifies state authority to manage what we some, sometimes call uh, natural resources also serve as generative of other more diverse views and understandings of the world. So speaking about, again, the algorithm and different sources of data, um, increasingly in, in the, um, through uh, geolocational and, and remote sensing tools, um, he talks about how these technologies open up other possibilities for those, and this is coming from the abstract from, for the talk today, those who beyond the state might leverage this data. You talked about your mapping at uh, mapping community fishing communities at sea. Um, 
And you point to new opportunities, again, I think that to bigger and more accessible data sets might present um, for interdisciplinary teams to counter map, query, and visualize. So here's um, where my question begins. It's a bit of a perennial question and a big one, but I'm gonna post it anyway. Um, Western society, of course, is structured around and stubbornly holds on to capitalism. And I'm gonna to relate this to this to some work um, that I've been involved in, but that's been led by a postdoc that I had the opportunity to supervise a year or two ago named Lauren Dacopoulos. And Lauren led work looking into Global Fishing Watch, which I'm sure many of you are aware of, um, as an organization and public facing mapping website. So the, anyone can, with a computer and internet connection can go online and engage with a Global Fishing Watch map that shows um, vessel movements that the Global Fishing Watch algorithms presume to be movements of, of fishing vessels or vessels while they are fishing. Um, so this is exciting, of course, for, for public awareness and the ability to engage with data. And um, fisheries science is already evolving to integrate this data into its understanding of, of fishing in the high seas. At the same time, and this is where, um, uh, where it comes back to the question that I have, Global Fishing Watch would not be able to generate maps and tell us anything if not for global ocean regimes that structure, structure and seek to govern industrial fishing, for better or for worse. So provisions in the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea that demarcate domestic and international waters and that require um, automatic identification system trackers on large vessels, um, these, these are the things that underlie the generation of the data sets that they're representing on their maps. So limitations in these global regimes become limitations potentially in our data sets and visualizations. So to summarize my big question is here is how do we push towards larger shifts or maybe something that sometimes scientists call tipping points as we work within structures and systems at the same time that we're looking to hopefully transform them. Um, and then the second remark and, and leading to a question is I would be keen to hear your reflections on another question that your talk brought to mind that I, I, um, I sort of pose here as, as was put in a piece by Becky Mansby et al. in 2015 is that what does environmental politics look like after nature? Um, this question in their piece stems from their contention that quote, although scholars have convincingly demonstrated the ubiquity and complexity of what many of us discuss as social natures, relatively little attention has been paid to understanding the politics internal to these uh, social natures. So this is a question with digital dimensions, which is why I raise it here. And I'm interested in these um, and work on with a U of Guelph colleague named Roberta Hawkins. So if environmental politics are less about the maintenance of some pristine nature and more about groups of people disagreeing over histories and values, and really about contesting hierarchies and priorities um, that stem from them, Roberta and I wonder what there is to say about the digital. Um, so again, like networked portals, social media platforms, live maps, databases, so these things we're talking about today, not just as a space or as a set of tools, but as a structure at work uh, in reconfiguring who is perceived as expert, who gets to participate in debates, whose preferences advance and how. And I think there were um, poignant moments of your talk, Kevin, where, where you were pointing to some of this. So I'd be curious if you have thoughts on the broad question of environmental politics after nature and more specifically what the digital may or maybe not mean um, to who participates and what is able to draw and sustain attention uh, as a result. So I'll, I'll wrap up there and say thanks again for the invitation and thanks for your, uh, your talk, Kevin. I'm happy and, and looking forward to um, the rest of the conversation. Thanks, uh, Bonnie and Jennifer. Um, I'll probably just shift to allowing Kevin to reflect on uh, the discussants comments and, and obviously the, the direct questions from, from Jennifer. Um, just looking at the time, we're a little bit behind. So in the interest of opening up to the, um, the observers, um, I'll probably wrap this up in five or, five or eight minutes. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Thanks, thanks Bonnie. Thanks. Thanks, Jen. I'm just really honored to, to get your comments and questions. And um, not sure I can do them justice at all, but I'll, I'll do my best. Uh, thanks again. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share the screen again, just really quickly. Um, I just want people to see this, which, um, which hopefully will relate to a number of themes here, right? This is, I have it labeled footnote um, for this talk. 
And the title there is the title for our, a current research project that I'm working on right now. Uh, and this is one of those NSF convergence accelerator projects. And if anyone knows anything about that, it's really intense. Um, but it's a, it's a large group of interdisciplinary scientists who are primarily interested in, and I say primarily, this is what's driving it, primarily interested in getting um, projections of climate change, which is to say projections of how the environment in, is going to change marine environment into uh, ideally fisheries management. But to sort of do that work, right, it's framed bigger. It's, it's framed in terms of blue economy and it's uh, framed in terms of a regional climate change projections. And this is where it also relates to some of Bonnie's points, right? To enable equitable ocean planning uh, for the blue economy, right? So it's, it's a big task, uh, but it has as its core, a really a data driven kind of a project where the goal is to take these projections and integrate them into ocean planning. You can imagine fisheries, right? Like the way it ignores future uh, states um, projected currently. Uh, but then like the more that the project developed, right? Conceptually, like what does that look like? How do you get regional climate change projections into planning, right? The more that that project that I'm on kind of developed, it turned into, you know, developing an online data portal essentially, right? Developing a kind of digital approach to reflecting and I would argue constituting this kind of digital ocean. Um, and for me, that then becomes the site of struggle, right? That becomes the site of the kind of politics I'm interested in, right? The politics of, you know, reform versus changing everything, the politics of, you know, um, building an infrastructure for capitalism versus building an infrastructure that's open to a diversity of economic achievements, right? Uh, an infrastructure that can only accommodate you know, quantitative ecological science versus qualitative ethnographic uh, conclusions, right? That's a site where I see myself struggling over those issues. Um, and so what's happening? What, how am I struggling? What does it actually look like? Well, you know, I'm insisting that, of course, there be a third button on this particular tool that we're developing. And if you look, I, this is just one, like it's, it's at such the baby prototype phase, I can't even show you much of anything, but except I can show you that um, when you're using the future blue tool, you will select an area in the ocean, think wind farm uh, or conservation area or other kind of lease block, and it will tell you what's going on in there. Right? It'll tell you what's going on in that block. And what, I, what we are developing and what I, I think everyone's on board with is that what it's gonna tell you about that block is not just uh, a list of, a list of uh, oceanic states, right? Fish species and bottom type and current flow. It's also going to show you a socio-ecological context which is to say it's gonna tell you a lot, using that communities at sea data, it's gonna tell you a lot about who fishes there and for how long they fish there and which communities are dependent on that area of the ocean. In addition, and with a, a more than just a nod to the ethnographic, we're also going to have a layer of data that are vernacular place names. And when you click on the vernacular place name, you'll get linked to the voices of the fisheries oral history projects that will connect those kinds of qualitative assessments and uh, rich, rich data to this location in the ocean, right? It's more complicated than that, but you get the idea. So if you look at our buttons over here, not only are we gonna show you a bunch of stuff, dashboardy kind of stuff about species, we're gonna show you a bunch of dashboardy stuff about people in that location in the ocean, right? Like this is my dream come true. Um, but my point is that that becomes for me the site for these kind of struggles, uh, political and otherwise, that that um, yeah, that are very real to me, and that I and that I work hard at, and I try to enroll everybody in the same project, right? Like as I'm as I'm doing it. So that I think I think that speaks clearly to it. Really echoes the report that Bonnie was referencing, right? In terms of kind of thematically, like this is what 
the Biden administration is building into the NSF as well as into other other projects where you want you know big data, big digital, let's go and create a digital ocean. But at the same time, there's this integration and, and prioritization for equitable, the equitable, the marginalized, and the and the so on. And I'm hoping that I can get that into this project as well as best I can. Um, and I think it speaks a little bit to uh, some of Jen's comments, uh, although I don't want to take up much more time, you know, that the um, the after nature got me thinking about how do I think about this socio-ecological, right? That this place in the ocean that I'm showing you on this uh, slide, you know, is a site of, uh, it is no longer a site of a natural process. It is always a site of human socio-natural emergence and so on and so forth. I mean, we can get more theoretical about it, but that's kind of how I think about it. And so I want, I want, you know, I want the wind energy CEO to understand where those place names came from and what is their relationship to the environmental, social, economic history of this place, right? It's complicated and it's hard to do in the digital, um, but I think that's the place where I wanna try to activate it um, as best I can. So, you know, the big question about using the tools and getting out of uh, it or not, I can only reference you know, just so much kind of feminist uh, STS work about reclaiming tools um, and making them uh, understanding their objectivity in a particular way or a limited way, situated way, and seeing them always as, as sites of a, of a politics, you know. Well, Bonnie, Jen, uh, any reflections? Um. I, yeah, yeah. I mean, thanks, thanks, Kevin. Um, I guess I have uh, to the to the idea of the digital as a space of where these politics can be, re you know, represented and, and pushed and played out. I thought it was interesting in your talk where you mentioned how the head the headlines, the you know, traditional print um, media picked up in their headlines the more told stories essentially about community, although that had been kind of compressed in the paper itself. And that, and that was an, that's an interesting thing for me, right? Because that's like um, there's still this this the structure is stuck such that there's still this role for the traditional, in this case, media, like traditional modes of of, of communication and representation. And so I thought I thought that was really interesting um, how they did that work, although the reviewers did not want to. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's right. And I think, um, you know, and the connection I was trying to make was that, of course, because in the work, in the paper, the word community was, community was the unit of analysis that any reporter reading it, you know, would then in some sense be forced to use the word community, right? Like there's a, and then have it relate to um, actual live fishing communities, you know? Um, Whereas arguably in the paper, there's not a whole lot of actual live fishing communities. There's just a bunch of graphs, you know? So it's a very interesting, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, I you know, you know I, this is so, so exciting, Kevin. I hope you can get the people button in there and make it real. And it is, you know, it is, it is a constant problem of having information that is considered, considered valid in this context and so having using the oral history project is, is or why not just go straight through to the people talking and um but it's a, it's there's you know i mean that's some sort of thing we have to we have to respect and protect that kind of information as well and it's, it's another form of the digital that uh really needs to get a, even a lot more support than it has already and i think it's 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 it's, it's under threat because it's it's expensive and and it's not clear how it's being used. So if, I mean, I'm just I'm urging you to go ahead and say, look, this is really important. We've got to have it, and you know, this will give it give them a little more a little more of an argument to maintain that that kind of thing. Um, but it's it's um, you know just generally, I think that we have to continue to demand and but most and also I probably primarily find um, find people who are stakeholders who really care demand more information about 
about the people side of things. And, and I know that there are ethical issues, there are privacy issues and so forth about collecting the kinds, some of the kinds of data that, that uh, really are important to have if you wanna understand who's getting, who's getting the benefit, who's, who's getting the, who's not. And, and all those really basic questions are almost impossible to, to answer using the kinds of data that we now have for fisheries. And because fisheries become increasingly marginalized, the census data doesn't help as much at all either. Well, thanks, folks. I, I'd like to keep this this discussion going, but we should get to the um, the questions from the audience. Uh, we do have three, I think, right now. So I'll, I'll get to those, and and we'll continue the discussion through those. Um, so I'll just look at the first one here from Ajith Raj. Um, who says, when it comes to top bottom development planning, um, top to bottom development planning, a lot of landscapes, resources, and spaces that community finds as resourceful will be overlooked and diverted uh, for various development activities. How do we make community based maps that are quote unquote scientific and acceptable for the state to claim their rights over certain spaces in the oceans or coasts that the state may find less value in? And can community-based maps be used for, as a legitimate tool for community in negotiating larger development initiatives with the state apparatus, which maybe extends on the recent discussion around your uh, new initiative, um, Kevin, in terms of the, the new side of politics that might come out of this. Yeah, yeah thanks so much for that, that, that question. Um, and well, two, two things that are in that question, right? One is sort of this idea of making claims vis-a-vis uh, -vis the state, right? Creating a visibility and uh, a kind of claim to a place on, on the behalf of community. And I think, I think mapping and of course what we call counter mapping has been in that space for, for several decades now, right? Especially around um, indigenous rights and so on to natural resources but also in other places, in fishing, right? There's some very completely clear projects that are about um, defining spaces as a way to show presence in the ocean and a need to preserve the access to those locations. So I'm all about that. I'm like totally, totally excited uh, uh, still uh, about the way maps have that power vis-a-vis um, -vis kind of state recognition, even in, you know, legal terms, right? They've been used in courtrooms and so on and so forth to make arguments on behalf of a variety of communities. So that's, um, I think, entirely possible. And there's a real practice around that for sure. Um, that's, that's global, right? Um, but what else is in that question too, or at least in, in, in my work, is about that relationship then um, what else can communities do, right? That rap, being on the map is one step, but being um, having one's um, capacities enhanced by connections to other processes in the ocean that are going on, right? Like how is it that we can speak about the dynamics of community in the ocean and its relationship to other dynamics going on in the ocean, right? So rather than just this idea of let's claim this, that's all about impact analyses, that's about access and preserving it, but what might be the relationship between community level economies and other blue economy developments in the ocean? What's the relationship between environmental change and fishing practices and dynamics over time? You know, what's the relationship between conserving whale breeding grounds and other kinds of harvesting, right? Like, the, like, how do we really get at the dynamics at a community level relating to the dynamics in the ocean? That's different than just being on the map because one needs to be get state recognition. It's about using um, the digital as a site of engagement and intertwining, maybe even negotiation between forces and practices and so on in the ocean that communities should be part of, right? I guess that's my argument there. So I know that's a lot, but it's like this, writing this has been, for me, that's been the hardest part is differentiating those two moves, right? The kind of classic counter mapping. And on the other hand, the digital as a site of engagement and transformation and combination like that's a different kind of um ontological becoming than 
state recognition vis-a-vis -vis the, you know, a map. And I think, uh, and Bonnie sort of mentioned it in the context of what's often called, you know, integrated management. So thinking beyond narrow um, sectoral issues and, and integration relationships, uh, really interesting. Uh, another question, and the discussants might be able to jump in on this one too, um, from Julie Reimer, uh, can the speaker and discussants elaborate on their experience with digitizing or spatializing robust qualitative data particularly around the loss of qualitative richness. Open to anyone. What is meant by qualitative richness? I don't know if they'll uh, <laughs> elaborate themselves, but maybe I can assume or, or think about, you know, the, the richness of, you know, stories and, and narrative that, you know, I guess social scientists tend to um, tend to use. Um, yeah, I mean, <clears throat> not, I don't have as much experience with that within sing singular projects that I lead, um, where it is coming up, I think, and, and Kevin talked a bit about kind of certainly about interdisciplinary work, but, um, and how this gets integrated potentially into models and modeling. Um, and so I'm be curious to hear what Kevin and Bonnie would have to say about this, but I think that in, in interdisciplinary teams, I'm finding, first of all, there are a growing number of scientists of different sorts who are very interested and aware of these dynamics that we're talking about today, which I think is awesome. And um, a lot of those folks um, work on or, or use models and modeling in their work. And they're sort of, I've come at this with groups interested in um, fisheries science and fisheries models where they're actually actively trying to have those models better um, attend to space, dy dynamics of fish in space. Um, but that those questions, then, then those conversations actually become easier to have about the dynamics of humans, dy dynamics and, and relationships and stories of humans in space as well, um, which has been really exciting. It's a very, diff I don't have an answer as to how you integrate all of that into a, um, a model and modeling project, but uh, almost like the idea of space or the, the challenge of space is like a boundary object that we, we can use to discuss with one another in a, in a somewhat of a kind of common language. Um, yeah, so that's what comes to mind for me in, in response to that question. Yeah, I, just quickly, I, to my mind, this is, this is a really core question. Um, and, and, you know, in so many point, places where there is public deliberation and the, their rules and their traditions about what kind of evidence is acceptable and what is not and so forth. Um, we have a real problem with, with, with narratives, with anecdotes. And, I mean, the term anecdote becomes derisive actually when we're thinking about it, but it, it, when it shouldn't be. Um, so it's a real problem. And I know that we've, we've discussed it a good bit in, in the committee that I just finished chairing and realize that we really haven't even, we really need to come together. And now we, I'm here, I'm thinking about different disciplines, but with different, very different standards of evidence. Cultural anthropologists um, and a neoclassical economist have very, very different standards of evidence and, and, and so forth. Um, and, and different points, different positions of power given the overall, overall setting. So anyway, what matters is the, is the place, is the site or the traditions of the site and so forth. And we really, maybe Kevin's right. These digital sites could be new places where we can come up with new understandings and new, new sets of rules about what kinds of evidence work in what ways. And um, so I, I think that that would be you know, something that I would like to see much more work done. Just thinking about these questions of, of evidence. I'll, I'll just say one quick word, Paul, if that's okay. Yeah, I, I worry a lot about the, the loss of qualitative richness when reducing communities to uh, a set of pixels on a map, right? Like it's, um, but I also, I also know that in that form, um, it, it does become a boundary object that lots of different disciplines can suddenly recognize as something to talk about, manipulate, understand, uh, link to other things. And here I'm talking about the ecological scientists I work with that somehow when it's in that form, it becomes something they're concerned about very curiously, right? Um, so for me, you know, and maybe this is, 
naive, but I, I look for and think about, I, I try not to think about it as a, as a reduction of community, but as an opening for community in sites where there would not have been an opening for it otherwise. Like that's a really different way to, that's just a flipping it on the head, right? But I think that that's ver been very productive for me. Um, and I continue to think of what I'm doing in those terms, so, you know. Thanks. Yeah, and what what came to mind to me too is a, a you know article I think it was in Science. Uh, Jane Lubchenco and Stephen Gaines. Uh, the title is a new narrative for the ocean, uh, and they're calling for new narratives. So the, even scientists. So it might be about finding, you know, strategically linking with with scientists and others who might be thinking about and open to different ways of thinking and knowing. Um, again, being at the risk of needing to be legitimized by scientists or policy policymakers, but uh, you know that's one way to think about it too. Um, final question here from Charlie Mather. Um, thanks so much, Kevin. Always so interesting. I was thinking about the communities that are no longer fishing. No longer fishing communities, question mark. Uh, I suppose one of the problems with the blue economy is that it is always looking uh, forward or forward looking. Is there a way to adapt digital tools to reflect or address loss and dispossession, or do they not appear in the data sets? Is there a way for representing these places and potentially leading to redress? Thanks again to everyone for such an amazing session. Um, yeah. Uh, I'll, I'll just jump in quick. Thanks, Charlie. That's just a really um, profound question and one I struggle with too. Um, and one of the things that, you know, it, in terms of the digital, there is in that data, you know, now 25 years of that data that I that we're manipulating and using. And of, and of course, as you saw on those big columns, like, why are we making those big columns? It's not, it's not to focus on the colors, it's to focus on all that white space that suggests the absence of communities, right? Those, those, um, you know, our friend Brian Harley would say those silences on the map speak volumes, right? Like of what's not there. And I think that that's, something that I wanna pursue further. So for example, one of the things we're talking about for my current project, and, and it's it's just our little internal name, where we're like, can we also in the, it, you know, when, when you go to query that place in the ocean and want to know what's going on, to what degree will we also know what was going on, right? To what degree will it also display the ghost community that um, disappeared 10 years ago as having had a really active engagement with that part of the ocean and how can we make that matter in marine planning right like so and that's like just as that's like so easy to do given this data um, is to flag which ones like how many can we, you know i'm imagining somebody zooming in on an area and saying oh i gotta really talk to the people in portland because they fish here Oh, and there were seven other communities that used to fish here and they're gone now. You know, they don't fish here any longer. Um, what's up with that? Like, it's, I, I think that's profound. And I, yeah, I don't know where that goes, but thank you, Charlie. I'm so interested in it. Yeah. That reminds me of Ted Ames' work in Maine. And even the question of permanency, because some of these communities may no longer be fishing for 10 years, but what's to say that they cannot become fishing communities again? Um, so yeah, I think, and that might be the power that having that map and information in there. Um, I, I just, Jen, um, yes. uh, feels like a, a good moment to advocate for, so I think that Kevin, Kevin being able to have access to the, the trip, um, reports, like that's, that obviously underlies the ability to spatialize some of that. And I, so I don't, haven't had been able to get access to that in, in my work, um, but I have been using um, data um, around license holdings, like who, who holds what license and trying to push back further in time with that where the records aren't that great that I've been able to get a hold of so far. But I think there's also a layer that is with that offers the opportunity to um, get at the question of access or changing access um, to, to the resource over time, um, because obviously if there's been a, if there's been a story of consolidation or, or of concentration of, of access, then that's, that is a great way to, um, well, to be able to quantify that, but also to, to tell and to show that story. 
So I think it's, it's interesting, right, depending on the jurisdiction where you're working, <laughs> what may or may not be made available to you um, through the state, through publicly available state records is, is different. Um, and I, I reflected on that a little bit in preparation for today as well as like, oh gosh, it'd be great to have access to those types of records that Kevin has been able to get and how can I do that? And anyhow, but I, I think there are different layers you can put on based depending on where you are and what you're able to get your hands on. Yeah, and I think uh, lots of fascinating methodological insight from, from Kevin's talk. And I'm sure we, a lot of people might want to follow up with Kevin and say, how did you do this? How did you do that? So um, I'm looking at the time, folks, and I really wish we could continue this discussion, but I do encourage folks to uh, continue it in other venues and, and means. Um, so I'd like to end off by reminding people that uh, today's webinar is part of an OFI People in the Ocean Speaker Series, and there will be more of these in the months ahead. So please stay tuned um, and uh, you should be able to find out details from OFI's website for updates. Um, I'd like to also thank Barb Nice, who has led the committee and organizing for this series and thanks to the OFI for its support. Um, and finally, of course, I would like to thank our panelists, Kevin and discussants Bonnie and Jen for this really incredibly rich and important discussion that uh, we have to cut, cut, cut uh, off right now, but uh, I hope to see you all soon in, in different places. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you very much. Thank you.